Welcome everyone to yet another installment of Tribe Master Yo Mind, where we talk to, um, I, I love to say, influencers and hit makers and, and people who are actually, um, you know, having an impact on their local communities, on their, on their, you know, industries, et cetera, et cetera. And today I'm super stoked uh, because I got family in the house for a change um, of introducing uh, Rory Davis and Michael Phyllis, who are amazing, amazing creators. Um, and specifically, uh, they are based in San Francisco. Um, and one of the communities that has been hardest hit by COVID is the artistic community in San Francisco specifically. So um, just a quick bio, Rory has choreographed for countless shows, events, street fairs, and celebrations all over the country. Um, he teaches a weekly dance fitness class called Roryography as on Zoom, Airbnb, um, Airbnb experiences, and also in uh, San Francisco's Dolores Park when the weather permits, of course. Um, Michael, uh, who I actually know of, by the way, uh, has been uh, making big gay art in San Francisco for the past 15 years. Um, his original LGBT themed plays and solo shows have been produced in theaters, universities, festivals all over the US. And I'm super excited to hand it off to my tribe chair in the Pacific region, Ro Hopper, who is going to do the honors of uh, interviewing these two amazing, amazing artists and hearing their perspective on how they've basically kept it together in one of the most odd, oddly fantastic in a weird way, years of, of uh, in recent history and uh, hearing kind of their reality and how they've mastered their minds to continue to thrive in some very uncertain times. So Ro, take it away. Yay, thank you Phoenix. Thank you for this platform. So. Welcome everyone, this is the fourth episode of Master Your Mind, and huh, it just keeps getting better and better, right Phoenix? So anyway, as Phoenix said, our guests today, they have a long list of inspiring, informative, motivational, and yes, crazy stories that we will hear about. They have a wide spectrum of accomplishments, so in the next 30 to 35 minutes, we'll do some storytelling. So take out your milk and cookies or in true Phoenix form, bubblies and popcorn. <laughs> so stories that will give us insight into a very different, but very relatable and very applicable set of learnings. That's for sure. Because here in Mastering Our Mind, we're trying to acknowledge and also talk about things that we're facing not everything is great but there are a few things that this phase has taught us and Michael and Rory are prime examples of just spunk and scrappy and pivot oh wait no we're not using pivot anymore we have a new word we're using pirouette, pirouette by the honey. way we don't pivot yes <laughs> we don't pivot anymore <laughs> you can add in an arabesque as phoenix was saying so we'll chat about all the new and hard realities that this new world has brought us as well as uh, how we can cope and move forward and after the storytelling we'll open up for questions and comments and Anything that you want to ask Rory and Michael? Sound good? All right. I saw some thumbs up. So here we go. So Phoenix introduced Rory and Michael, a long list of accomplishments. There are a few things missing. <laughs> so Rory Davis, yes, choreographer, director, performer, instructor. I'm going to add a few things that you did not put in your bio, Rory. Bodyguard, car washer and most recently, a San Francisco landmark. There's lots to unpack there. We'll be, we'll be right back after I talk to your or introduce your, your equal half. Michael Phillips, Phyllis, director, actor, writer, filmmaker, educator, creator, HR icon, uh, fashion editor, <laughs> and wait, you don't have bodyguard in your bio. You do have vampire slayer. Mm hmm so we're, we're gonna unpack that so okay first off I want to hear about San Francisco landmark because that's the latest and I think one of the most fabulous things that happened in just the last week right 
Yeah, I, I found out in the past week, if anybody's familiar with the with San Francisco and the the hearts that pop up annually, those big sculptures, I found out unbeknownst to me that I'm on the next one that's being unveiled. Um, and I'm not sure, the way that this works is an artist, I guess, is assigned to paint one of these giant, I'm guessing metal hearts, and then they're bid on and placed somewhere and they either go outside of a museum or SFO or somewhere sort of prominent. I think, Michael, you saw one in, in someone's home, right? Yeah, some really rich guy has one on his terrace, but you know, they're all over the place. Was it Phoenix? <laughs> <laughs> You'll be never next. know because you all know my address, so that ain't happening. <laughs> someday, yeah, someday we'll have a heart. I was tagged on Instagram, and I thought one, I thought it was a bot or something at first because I didn't recognize the name or the photo at first, and I was like, "What is this?" and looked, and then it was like, "Oh, that's cute. What is this?" and then it was like, "Oh, it's one of those hearts. Is that me?" And so it turns out that I do teach uh, my my dance fitness class, choreography, sort of in the spirit of a uh, Richard Simmons or like Jane Fonda, if that's more your thing, uh, 80s class. I do that in Dolores Park now on over the weekends. And it turns out that the artist, who I still haven't met in person, we've never spoken, was driving by and heard Bananarama or some something I was playing, heard the music and looked over and saw what it was and did a little bit of research and digging and found out what my class was and then found a photo that was posted online of, of me with, with this jacket on and with a few people from the class. So it just happened to be that me and then these random assorted people that attended class that day and posed for this photo are now immortalized on, <laughs> immortalized on, this, uh, on this piece of artwork that will be somewhere hopefully pretty cool in San Francisco. So that was a big surprise and a, and a nice thrill for me. I'm very excited. And you're all You should get royalty too. every time somebody poses. <laughs> like <laughs> that should be a thing <laughs> i have like diehards that take the class all the time and they're like why aren't i on it and i'm like I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, and I so this is a prime example of how your your brand even without you knowing it just keeps expanding when you're true to something and authentic to something that you're passionate about you can't help it people will take notice right. and this is one of those things that's so good for all of us to always know. Someone's always watching and making notes about how you present yourself and how you come to the table or come onto the dance floor in your case. Michael, you were saying something. Sorry, I interrupted you. Uh, oh, no, no, not at all. It's just I, I learned about this project too. I guess there's one of these hearts a year. And it's interesting that on that heart, you know, Rory and all the people that are on it are wearing their masks. And it's just, you know, like this is 2020. This is, it's in the art now. You know, whenever you look back on that piece of art, it will have you wearing the mask. You know, it's just, it's just kind of interesting that that's what's reflective this year and that you're, you're a part of it. Right. Mm -hmm. And we're happy that we're actually being portrayed as a place that does wear the masks. <laughs> so that's a good thing. So there's one other, other role that I mentioned earlier, bodyguard. Okay, not just any bodyguard, but... I was a, body, I was a bodyguard for, for one night once, and it was sort of by accident, but it was for a client that you, that you may have heard of. I was, I was a bodyguard for Cher one night. <laughs> so I, I you may have heard of her. You may have heard of her. <laughs> I, I choreographed for, for lots and lots of drag queens here in San Francisco, and primarily for one named Peaches Christ, who does movie parodies. And we did, a couple of years back, there was a parody of the Witches of Eastwick that we did. It was the Witches, the Witches of East Bay. And there's a very, very well-known um, drag performer named Chad Michaels, who is so renowned for his uh, Cher impersonation that he's actually friends with Cher. And they've, they've done photos standing next to one another where you can't tell who's who. Um, so we befriended Chad's Lovely and, and we became great friends and that show toured to New York City. So we've gotten close with Chad. And uh, what was it, Michael, in the span of about a day, right? It was, there was a morning where we had nothing planned, the two of us, the day was we had off. And then word got out that this was a little over four years ago that at Oasis, our home club in San Francisco, where, where we primarily perform, there was an event happening that night and it was a, a benefit for the, for the Clinton um, election that was coming up, the Clinton campaign. And then word slowly got out that day that it was that Cher was appearing at the club that night. And we were like, oh man, that's so crazy. I'm sure it's, and I think it was, it was we could not afford to get in, but then we found we out. Sold that, out. 
Yeah. 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 We, when we found out that our friend Chad, the drag performer was appearing that night and we were like, Oh, that's cool. That's so cool. And then I was like, wait a minute, let me, we have all these numbers with Chad. Like what's, is Chad performing? So I texted Chad and was like, what are you doing? Like, can we bust out that, you know, the turn back time medley or whatever it was. And Chad was like, yeah, you know what, let's do it. So then we were invited to show up that night, but then we were to, Michael, we were told to wear, to wear, was it the club? Yeah, they were like, wear all black. Wear, Just wear, wear all black. Wear we like, black. Okay. So we were like, but that's not the costume, but okay, well, I mean, we'll do whatever. We'll be in the same room and share, who cares? And then it turned out that the club like didn't have enough notice or enough warning to hire enough security. So we showed up, it was me. I was the biggest, toughest guy there. And then the next in charge was my <laughs> These two little skinny ballerina guys. It was a row. It was Will and Jerry. Who were the oh, boy. The four They're half the size yeah. of glory. I them over my head. Like, um, so, yeah, they were like, oh, you guys, uh, like, Cheryl will be coming in through here. And we were like, what is happening? We had no, we didn't know what was going on. So then it turned out that she basically would, was appearing. She was behind a curtain, but people paid, it was like several thousand dollars to, be able to talk to her for, I think it was 20 seconds. And then it was my job to like gently take their arm and walk them away. And the Clinton people were like, everyone will be in shock and they'll just go with you. And they all did. It was like, but the, it was kind of a blur the whole time because I was like, I have no training. I've never, I have no training for this. I've never been in a fight. I was like, if something happens, I will run. So I was like, <laughs> the whole time, I didn't even enjoy it. I was like, but she said two things to me when she first arrived. She, she asked, she was like, how long did they tell you to allow people to stand with me? And I said, oh, they said 20 seconds. And she was like, 10, make it 10. I was like, you got it. You're the boss. And then at the very end of the night, there were like probably two to three hours of photos being taken. And it's, I mean, it's astonishing. You see, you see grown men, grown men, like would turn the corner and see her and would just collapse and they would take them away. Like she didn't want to see people losing it. She was lovely, but you could tell like she's, she's, she's got no time to waste, you know? You've seen it all. She has seen it all. She has seen it all. So yeah, and then at the end of the night, the last photo was taken and she was leaving the, she was leaving the, or they said to her, they were like, thank you, you were lovely. Thank you so much. And she started to leave and then she looked back at me and she was like, oh, he didn't get a picture and she took one with me and then left. And you know, for Cher to spare those extra five seconds, I was like, oh my God. So yeah, I mean, I guess I'm a bodyguard to the stars one night. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God nothing happened, okay? I know. You're not I know. If someone tried, <laughs> I know. If anything had happened that night, I would have run, and I would have been the person, like, I would have been my face on, like, hard copy that night. Like, yes, gay man kills Cher, yes. He <laughs> runs from Cher, like. <laughs> Inept bodyguard, let's share down. Yes, it could have been worse. See? Talk about scrappy and resourceful. You had no idea what you were walking into. That, that morning. So I, relatable for some of us. A Netflix marathon that day, and then I was Cher's bodyguard, so. Yep. <laughs> you were just prepared. You were like on it. Whatever. Shape shift me. I'm that person. Whatever you need. Exactly. Most of us know. Shape shift me. What should I change into? When? Now? Right now? Yeah. So. Say yes. We're yeah. what? Okay, let's do it. Like, yes. <laughs> exactly. Now, Mr. Phyllis, Michael. So you don't have bodyguard under your resume, but you do have Vampire Slayer. Yes. Yeah. Talk one about of my, Vampire Slayer. <laughs> one of my favorite gigs uh, that I've done for the last four years, not, not including this one, is uh, playing the drag version of Buffy the Vampire Slayer here in San Francisco at Oasis. Um, they're sort of known for their drag parodies and they do all kinds of them. Golden Girls is one of their biggest. They're about to do their Golden Girls year-end holiday episodes. Get your tickets. Uh, and we started doing the uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer in 20, whatever, four, five years ago would be. Um, and it was such a big hit. Uh, we, we sort of condensed all of season one into one evening and people loved it, whether they'd seen the show or not. And uh, then we did that for season two and season three. And then this last year we did the uh, musical episode. So Rory was also in that. He played vampires and demons that I got to slay. Um, so that was fun. And it was also a lot of dance in that one since it was the musical. So it was a good chance for us to collaborate together. And I wouldn't say that I'm like a pretty girl. Um, I've had a lot of help. I've, I've gotten prettier over the last four years. I have the same wig. <laughs> Uh, can we see a scene right here? Oh my gosh, you actually, you should do your line for them, Rory. Rory only had one line um, oh. in, in Buffy Once More With Feeling. 
So why don't you see if you can do it? And then I'll do my line after that I improvised. Go ahead. I'm gonna mess it up. Okay, here we go, ready. Mm. My master has the Slayer's sister hostage at the bronze because she summoned him. And at midnight, he's going to take her to the underworld to be his queen. Yeah, definitely more of a dancer than an actor. <laughs> so that was the line that I improvised after that. That's, I wasn't actually saying that just now. But it really worked in this, you know, that's part of the fun of doing a drag version is that you get to do, that was an actual line from the show, but then we get to mess around with, <laughs> yeah. See, you got a good stare, that's true. Amanda's got good taste, thank you. <laughs> I wish I had a steak that I could just have. I'm sort of crossing genres here. I'm in the Golden Girls living room, but we're talking about Buffy. You know, it's just when you're doing drag, you just sort of talk about saying yes. They were like, do you want to play a 16 year old girl who has supernatural powers? and kills vampires, so I was like, yeah, I'll do it. That sounds great. You're so like 16, huh? <laughs> 16, like, okay, but do I wow. still have big boobs? Like, you know, it was just one of those <laughs> one of those things. It's one, really one of my most fun gigs. I, I missed it this year. Well, but you also said, I remember us talking about how physical it was for you to do Buffy and how chill it was for you to do another role. One of my most favorites of yours is Patsy from Absolutely Fabulous, one of my most favorite series. Michael did Patsy. You walked onto the stage and I just thought, oh my gosh, I'm, I've been transported into BBC land. For those of you who have not seen Absolutely Fabulous, you must see Absolutely Fabulous from the very first to the very, there, that's Patsy. Yep. Cheers, oh Cheers, my though. gosh. See, exactly. So that was your <laughs> other role. So I, I remember so when Michael entered, you were like, it's her. I, yep, I was stunned. I was so stunned. But so beyond the mental, you've got so many things that you're having to incorporate just almost daily, even hourly, because you go from one character to another depending on what hustle and what gig you're doing in every day so we were talking about you're doing airbnb experience rory and then on maybe the afternoon you're doing roryography where you're live at the loris park and then michael you're doing patty from hr oh we haven't even talked about the hr icon so patty from hr is another character of yours can you tell us about what it's like at home when the two of you are together in your very typical San Francisco flat? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I don't know if, that, if we talked about that, but we are a couple. We've, it'll be 12 years in August, right? 12? 13? Yeah, you know, <laughs> Look at the there's, once you pass 10, you know, it's just sort of, I'm just happy to be here. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it's, we uh we've worked together for for many years um, we'll, we'll talk about baloney which is our sort of baby where we sort of equally co-parented this show that's now in its um going into its sixth year um so we're used to working together but also having our separate lives you know um rory with his with his dance stuff and i with my hr trainings and acting and and just all the we have things that intersect and then we have many things that don't um so this has been a very interesting time now that we are our work and our home have collided in a way that we've never had before our home has always been sort of like the storage unit the the staging ground the rehearsal space we use it for a lot of things um it's it sort of wears as many hats as we do it is a san francisco studio apartment i'm not great with square footage but it's small it's probably sm about the size of the golden girls living room total um with everything in it so you know we having to shift around and and make use of the space in different ways and for a while we had only enough internet to be able to zoom one at a time so we were sort of scheduling all that but so rory has his sort of studio takes place where we stack furniture on the bed and face it into the open space into the living room area and that's where the dance studio is and I have my office space, which is uh, our walk-in closet, which I'm in right now, um, you know, and so we're, we sort of make it work in terms of who's working where and doing what, but, um, but it is, we sort of do have to change hats almost, you know, a few times a day now that, that we're in the pandemic. You especially, Rory, will sometimes have up to like seven or eight events in a day, which is kind of mind boggling. It's sort of funny too, how we used to do that all the time where we would have like seven or eight errands or chores or tasks. And that was on an easy day. And now it's almost like if I have one Zoom a day, I'm exhausted. I'm just like, oh gosh, really, again? <laughs> <laughs> so, 
a day coming up. Um, so the class that I that I teach, like luckily, it worked in the '80s for Richard Simmons really well, where it's this follow in the moment. You know, I have this coach persona that I that I do, and when the when the pandemic hit, it was just like, oh, what is this Zoom thing? Okay, like you know, let's just go for it. And the response, I mean, it moved online, and then Airbnb did pick me up. So that's been nice in its own way, just because I've had like little small things that have happened where I've, I've thrown parties for people in Australia, but now I mean, on my own independently, I have I have worked with tons and tons of companies and it's i've been uh like birthday parties and and through airbnb i've gotten to work with some with some i can just keep dropping names if you guys want you want more, <laughs> more celebrities drop them drop them so yeah, I, I got an email from airbnb and they were like this uh, these celebrities are like they didn't say celebrities but this these important people want to do your Very class important. i was like oh you know so, um so it turned out that it was darren chris from the assassination of jenny versace and uh Glee. Glee, yeah, and then his friend was going to be there too, and I found out right beforehand it was uh, it was John Stamos, Uncle Jesse did my class. <laughs> it was like totally crazy. So it's things like that have popped up, and it's it's just been like uh, I I've, I've been I think just because this thing that I do happens to work well, like it's just been a very very fortunate. <laughs> I've been like very very lucky that it that it translated and that people are responding to it. And I've tried to make it in a way I, I teach a class for the public where it's just the zoom link is out there people can donate and that's just a general thing that goes for a half hour but i've tried to sort of roll with the times and respond to things where like i'll hold up signs where it's like go grab a pillow and then people do and then like it, we just start to beat them you know this is especially about two weeks ago where it was like people were getting like physical therapy and it was like the class is sort of like a slumber party anyway you know so i was trying to to get people to to have some sort of release, like give something back because it is a way for people to get together to dance, you know? What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> There's gonna bro, be a lot of that. Bro, shut us up, gosh. <laughs> well, I'm fascinated, so it's hard to shut you up. But so when you wake up, let's say you're teaching that day, do you already have it prepared as far as what you're going to do? Or do you get in front of your Zoom camera and then you just go, this is what I feel like. I always have a plan. I always have a couple of plans and none of them ever happen, ever, ever. Um, like there was, I, I did do a work thing for a, a company once and I could just tell even beforehand, there were like, I'm like, Ro, you're, you're gonna get like, you know, the sweats from this, but I could tell just, there were too many people emailing me and I knew something was up. And then I got into this Zoom thing and was like ready to rock. And I noticed that everyone had like, backdrops up that had like bumblebees on them and i was like oh that's cute like where where's my bee backdrop and it turned out that it was the whole point of the event that i was leading was a farewell party for somebody named b and no one told me like none of the the four people so they were like expecting all this specialized stuff and i was just like okay hey b i heard so much about it. you know you just have to plan everything but and with planning ahead too it is like i like when i do birthday parties and things like that too like there are times where you know you can you can feel the room when you're doing stuff and I've had it's been rare but a couple of times where it's a wall of people that are like you know you could just tell they're not into it at all and I had all these other things planned and it's just like okay let's do trivia you know you just have to you have to improvise all the time like thinking on your feet and before before this in person on stage when we perform I'm not I'm a dancer I want to know what we're doing I want to know what the count is I want to know everything um and now I think just because of this and just the way that the, the nature, the chaos of Zoom, it's kind of like forced me to be like, oh, I guess I, I can be good at this because I had to, you know? Mm -hmm. Improvise, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's one of the biggest learnings. If there's an, an upside to it, it's just about how, how adaptable we all can be. So letting loose a little bit on plans that don't go too well. I mean, just even today, I had to text Phoenix about 20 minutes before this session. Oh, hi, Phoenix. I just got this message. It said something on my computer. Unsecured Zoom network. <laughs> Someone is trying to steal your information. Like, what? So, but here we are. Hopefully, none of my financials are being stolen while you're talking to us. You got a bodyguard <laughs> anyway. in the room. You got a bodyguard. Oh, yes. Yes. There you go. <laughs> Amanda's like, no, not. It's not a good bodyguard. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's so, just in terms of like re talking about that, like having the rug pulled out, this was, this mm -hmm. was a definite 
this is a really tough year um, for so many people. Um, in in March, we I, I'd say that like we've been doing this a while. I've I've been in the city for for about 15 years and sort of over that 15 years built up the cred and the contacts and the the ability to sort of have a year scheduled in advance and that's about as 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 um, much success as i was hoping for you know really was just to have steady work all all year long and that's from an actor producer freelancer perspective non-union that's that's the dream you know was just to have all projects that we love that we were either um, that we were either leading or that we were a part of that we that we really cared about. We had the whole year booked and that's kind of the closest we're going to get to job security. And then come March, the, the, we lost it all basically kind of overnight. Um, so then, you know, then then what? I think we were talking about like the day, the day that it all hit was sort of March, March 13th. Rory's 13th. birthday is, is March 16th. So we had started doing this new event called Sausage Fest, which was um, an offshoot of our bologna party, which was like just a fun dance party. And we'd done once, it was really successful. And then we planned this one for March for March 13th, Friday the 13th, uh, the first Friday the 13th in Mar uh, March of this year. And it was right around then that everything started. We all, I mean, we could think back all of us to that time where it just felt like it was creeping in. It was, um, We'd seen some other events of friends that ours were doing that were larger than ours um, that were just getting shut down. Events at the cast show, our friend Peaches Christ that we brought up earlier. She had a big, really well sold show that had to cancel just a couple days before our Sausage Fest party. We were also in rehearsal for our first Bologna of the year, which was gonna premiere the following weekend in March. So we were already in that place where we're running on all cylinders. We're, you know, we're rehearsing, we're planning for this party, we're publicizing two events at once. That's, that's small for us, it's usually three or four you know um and then it started to sort of hit home with our event and and we had some people dropping out and um you know including our dj it was sort of like well there goes the music you know what do we do so we sort of the the evening before everything shut down we were already in that mode of like how do we adjust around this this thing and that event ended up being attended. Um, not all that many people as we were expecting, but you could tell how much people really needed to be there and how much that dread was weighing on all of us. And, and Rory who took over the music was like, I don't know what we're gonna play. I'm gonna play this, like put on this playlist, but I just know that at the end, let's play Keep On Dancing Till The World Ends by Britney Spears. Like that much we need, we're gonna end the party with that. And so we sort of had this feeling like the world's ending, you know, but it was sort of, tongue in cheek because we all thought we'd be back in April. Remember that? Remember mm -hmm. how, how wow. young and innocent we all were back then? So it was like, you know, we did this party, it sort of had that weight of it, but we thought, well, our show will still be okay. Maybe, you know, like maybe we should cancel the show. I think that the evening of Sausage Fest, we ended up writing to the club and saying, hey, you know, even though the, we, we are still allowed to have our event at this point, we sort of had to make the terrible decision to, to cancel a show. And coming from where I, I'm coming from as an actor, I mean, our our core rule is the show must go on. It is, I mean, we are, that is baked into our soul. Like that is the cornerstone of what we do. Like no matter what is going on with you, no matter what is happening in the world, that show needs to happen. And, you know, and I could tell you dozens of stories of how we've made the show happen, even when the show couldn't technically happen. And really it, it threw me, especially for a big loop when all of a sudden we had to cancel a show and then all shows were canceled. That's sort of the rule, the, the rule that you must never break was mm -hmm. broken, you know, that we, that we were unable to do the show and it was completely out of our control. And it was a show that we'd rehearsed for, that we were, that was ready, that was good, like such a good show. So many people involved, there were like 17 people all employed through this show. We don't get paid until the show happens you know, just to like let go of all of this stuff. I just kind of sat in the bed and watched the walls for like a week, frankly, in, in early March, just being like, well, if you can break the golden rule, then what was sacred? You know, if the show's not mm -hmm. going on, then what am I doing here? You know, it was, it was a real, it's a total trip. So honestly, I think that what helped me get out of the hole was Rory being like, well, I'm just going to do this class on Zoom. Like, you know, he just started doing stuff on Facebook and Instagram and just, and people started coming and we realized that the energy of people coming to that last sausage fest thinking that, you know, I want to get, I want to do this before I can't do this was, we still had that energy, you know, people still wanted that connection. They still wanted to commune 
um, but we couldn't do it the way that we had been told our whole lives that we could. I mean, if you think about like producing live events of any kind, but being an actor on stage, being a dancer on stage, our whole job is, the, is to be the anti Netflix and chill. You know, like we're, mm -hmm. our job mm -hmm. is to pull people out of their house against all, everything telling you to just stay and watch more and stream more, you know, our, our job has been to be the other thing that you could do, you know, the thing that where you do come into those rooms where you can't experience them anywhere else, you know, that you have to be present for them. And sort of making that a thing and being a part of that culture has been so important to us um, for our whole careers, and especially here in San Francisco. So to realize that we suddenly didn't have access even to what we're used to doing and the way we're used to doing it, it, I was sort of like, well, now what? And I mean, to just have somebody that was like, I'm just going to keep doing this and like seeing it right there in my living room was sort of like, okay, well, if he can do it, if there's people coming and they are so hungry for it, then we need to figure out how to do what we were doing before mm -hmm. without being in the physical world. You know, like there's a way if there's, if there's people to do it and there's an audience for it, then this is our new stage. We just have to figure it out. So you had to figure it out. And the one thing that I took from that is you had to see where energy would come back to you, but you also had to start from somewhere, whether it be from yourself or looking outbound. In your case, you were happy to stare at the wall, but for Rory, he couldn't. He needed to do something because, let's face it, it was income as well. But it is not always that you will just bounce back on your own. You need to rely on community, whether it be your personal or whether it be your, your colleagues, whether it be the neighborhood watch. You need something that will pull you out from watching the paint dry on the wall. And for you, Rory, was it, was it so difficult to just snap back? Was it primarily employment that you needed to get back into or... Was it a state of, if I let myself go, I will slide down right along Michael? I, you know, I think, honestly, it was just so surreal at the time. And we were so, so busy. And I'm so used to being busy that it was just like, like, I can't, like, I don't, I don't sit around usually, you know? So it was, mm -hmm. it was just like, so, so what do I do? And then I think it was also too, just you know, like, like, remember Michael when when it was all first starting too, and it was like should like I did I did one Zoom class on Monday and it went the first one went very well and a lot of people were there or no it was it was on social media at first row with the copyright stuff you know but um, oh yes a lot of people were there and it went really well and then I remember being like oh this was great and it was like should I do Thursday maybe I'll do Thursday too and it was like oh like who's the boss, you know, it was this like, cause even when I taught at studios and stuff, it would be like, oh, they'd be like, oh, this room's available at this time. And it was just so weird to be it's like this new frontier of being like, oh, well, I'll do it again. That was fun. You know, and it was kind of strange to be, even as an artist to just be like, oh, okay, well, I want to do this day, so I'll do it. And to call the shot. So I think, yeah, I mean, it was just the sort of thing where I think I needed something. I, it was like accountability too. I think I needed to like have something mm -hmm. <laughs> because and, and right. even on these squares to just see people and just to have some sort of interaction and I realize now I mean because we're how many months into this but there are a bunch of people that come all the time and then when I if I'm you know I missed like I had to cancel one class recently and people afterwards were like oh, I missed you so much and I'm like we've never even met but cool you know it's great like mm -hmm. it's really flattering it's so it's become a yeah I, I did it, I guess, for, for myself just to stay busy, but it's become something that matters to people. And that's, that there's no higher compliment. Yeah. Well, it's the power of connection. Again, the energy you put out is what comes back. And you made me think about accountability. So when all this happened and Phoenix, you and I were talking and all the other tribe members about what are you made of? This is the time. Things are not the same. And if you're thinking in a week or two or a month, you're going back to how it was. Oh, you're so mistaken. So, so grab whatever you can, grab whoever you can and pull everyone out somehow. And of course, there are moments when we all have to say, I can't, I'm leaning back. Mm -hmm. And there's also that authenticity about your truth to say can't leaning back watching the paint dry on the wall <laughs> for a little while and that's as important as 
forging ahead. Talking about forging ahead. So I'm sure you have stories of the obstacles, people, whether it be situation or people themselves who just stand in your way, blockers. So along the way, what are those sledgehammers? I know you're a bodyguard, but <laughs> when you are forced to, well, let's not go there because you were going to run. <laughs> what were those things that you have just learned to always have in your tool chest? You go for when it. somebody says no, or somebody says, that's not the way I want you to do it, or mm, I'm going to try and get away with this. Let's see if I can push them this way. Tell us some, some things that you can, you can educate us on. I think um, the, the biggest ones that come to me are more business related um, that we had without going too much into the details uh, about who this person was or where they were. I would say that we had a big obstacle in terms of a middleman in a business um, trying to basically cheat us, you know, like we were having a lot of trouble as new producers um, ha coming up against business people that would use their in inner knowledge of business and of the intricacies of, of sort of running their side of things sort of against us in a way that we didn't understand the, the numbers, right? That we, that when we would produce events, we were um, vulnerable to, um, to being taken advantage of because we didn't know the ins and outs of, of all of the business. So, um, that's something that I, I don't think that we necessarily solved. Um, but one of the tools that I learned was just to become a better business person that, um, I couldn't be ignorant of those things and that I had to get a larger picture of the numbers of the way that, that their business worked in order to understand better how our business fit into that. And, um, and that I sadly couldn't trust everybody, you know, couldn't just move forward blithely, um, thinking that people that were on the same team as us, you know, we're all in this together, right? If we make money, you make money, right? Um, that that's not always the case, you know? It, I, I wish that it was more often, and there certainly are people that we've worked with where it's just we're, we're all in this together, really, literally, and truly. But there are some people that will use your own, um, uh, lack of knowledge or knowledge against you, you know, and that's, it's sad, but I think rather than, rather than quitting and losing the opportunity to do any work, um, we just decided to insert ourselves more into the process and me in particular, where it was just like, well, if I don't understand it, then I'll figure out how to be with you so that you can explain it to me and you can show me all of the things that I need to understand it. And if you can't, open up the process even that much to allow me to understand it, then I sort of know there's something shady going on. And then I want to circle the wagons about from your whole organization and say, why is it impossible for us to learn more about this? If you're saying that I don't know how it all works, teach me how it works mm -hmm. and do the numbers right in front of me. And we're, you know, and I'll leave when we kind of agree together that these are the, the what they really are. So just kind of getting a little bit pushy and putting myself in there and also just, you know, kill them with kindness. That's my whole thing. I, I'm very conflict averse, but I am a Scorpio. I just had my birthday on October 24th. So I've been the nicest guy um, until I feel like we've crossed me and then the little tail comes up. So, and then Rory's really good at being the sort of strong, <laughs> silent, arms crossed in the background, um, just giving size and bodyguard energy, even though we all know from being in this meeting that if anything does happen, he's going to throw Cher in front of the bullet. But they don't know that looking at him, you know, he looks very imposing in person outside of the Zoom window. So uh, yeah, uh, if, if there's a problem, Michael's got like the, the, like the Kamala, like, Smile, and I'm the table flipper. Right, we got a housewife, <laughs> and we've got Kamala. So we're we're trying to, do, you know, it's sometimes you need that good cop, bad cop energy. We're lucky that we have the partnership, you know. But um, but yeah, I think that that learning about the business side of what we did, I think that a lot of artists that comes very last, if ever, you know. We just want to make the art. We don't want to sell the art. We want other people to do that for us, but we need the money, you know. So it's mm -hmm. it, it's not intrinsic to a lot of us. Um, so I feel like in a way I'm grateful to that shady mm -hmm. individual for making it so I couldn't just coast along. I had to become a better business person. I feel like I have and it benefited our organization. That just reverberates in 
this tribe world that we are so fortunate to be part of because see look phoenix is just mm -hmm. haven't i been talking about this with all of you <laughs> so hey phoenix you should teach them some more about business numbers and all that but well, yeah I so this is one thing that phoenix has been instilling and pulling us eas out of our comfort zone is to be business managers because most of the time those are things that are not part of our wheelhouse or it's not even afforded to us to be part of that kind of business transaction right. so it's it's refreshing to hear that even for you who is so far away from having to deal with that kind of corporate transactions you found the importance of you better wise up or else you have no point to start from with your argument yeah. and argument doesn't necessarily mean you're over there doing the bodyguard stance but it is helpful you have someone who pretends to be one <laughs> right right and, and frankly i feel like and, and i feel like just knowing what little i know about the tribe too i i feel like the more you know about how to how that business is built the more when it comes time to do your own producing to take out that middleman and to become the business yourself the more you know because you learned through this other business you learned from knowing mm -hmm. there and then you were able to say okay that i know it worked and didn't work over there and i'm going to build it the right way you know or at least know the tools to start building it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know it reminded me when you were talking about baloney and how you employ 17 people so the goal is to produce and perform and have this awesome amazing show that's the output but along the way all the things that you have to do as director and choreographer it makes me think of how us eas perform where we have to go from point a to point z and then there's the output but along the way you managed you led you pushed you pulled so it's amazing how in the most far apart way there's something so similar when you have a goal has it always been second nature to you to manage and lead and guide or is this something that just from doing it more often you were able to become better at yeah i mean i was always that kid in the group project that was like no guys i think it's this like i think we should do this but i it took me a while to find my voice to to be like no it's it, we're doing this you know like i i think that there's um that's that's come in time and and with um not not ever really with a super intentional choice but i do know that when i when i was in college i, I was an acting major and the first time that i ever wrote a show and directed the show um was like the senior year right before i graduated was the honors project um and i i had a lightning bolt moment where um after that show was done hearing the audience applauding so fervently just the enthusiasm around that was electrifying in that sense that it, it it proved to me that i had to be telling more stories that if i hadn't told that story nobody else would have and that it never would have happened you know so what it made me think okay what are what are more stories that i could tell where what are more things that i could create that were not there before because there's plenty of things that are already here and i could do a lot of those things as an actor but if I don't write this new material, then it will never be. So it sort of came out of this necessity to create projects. And so for a long time, I was a solo performer because I was the only one that I could afford. You know, I was the only one that I could, that would put in the time that, that was passionate about this project. I was the only one that stood to make any money because nobody was going to make any money. So it's sort of built over many years to then find the collaborators and to find the venues and to find the topics and the stuff. You know, when we did Baloney, it was another lightning bolt moment we did this it was at a friend's club it was a, they had opened in january this was february it was still finding its footing this is the reopened oasis in 2015 um and they were looking for content and we were just like hey we got some content for you how about we put porn and performance together and we'll do this show called baloney that's sort of a vintage porn review where it's it's all it's all the guys that we know from working with drag queens but we took the drag queen out and we just moved the guys forward and now it's about like <laughs> guys and and like exploring male sexuality and but it's also has female elements to it too we're going to explore like gender roles and stuff with it basically magic mike but what if it was actually gay you know like uh, the whole that like we just started it as this experiment really and 
didn't know what what we were even explaining to the guys but we were like would you just take off your shirt like at least you know so we could do these sexy things so we just did it as a lark the first time but the the electricity afterward proved to us yet again like this you have to do more of this you know mm -hmm. when you hit on something like that you have to keep going with it so then that's what baloney sort of became out of that then we were always trying to recapture that experience and to build on that original experience and go bigger um, and then it was sort of ballooned out from the two of us always as the creators to and, and a cast of like six other guys. It now then became at its largest, it was 17 just performers, not including any of the crew, any of the venue. It was like 17 people on a stage. I wish I had that picture in front of me. And it's a tiny stage, you know, it's a lot. It's a lot mm -hmm. of bodies. It's a lot of stuff. But, but in talking about, you know, how these two worlds connect it seems like obviously the common thread is always going to be people and managing people is the skill no matter what the venue and medium is you know and i think that we've learned over the years how we can be better managers to each other how to do our work better together because it's so non-traditional i mean we live together we work together there are not prescribed hours for this work we've had many a tense morning where i'm i wake up later i'm not the morning person he's been awake for hours he's already drained half the coffee pot my eyes open and he's like so what about this thing that we're going to do for the show what do you think about this you know it's just like one of those things where you're like hold on a second like we're on two different schedules like <laughs> let me have some of that coffee and then we'll talk about the costume that that Jenny's wearing for that, you know, it's just like, so, so just like finding our, our, our rhythm with each other as managers is definitely part of the deal, but you, you start to know what your team needs. Right. And, and I think this also comes from working as an educator. I, I teach high school that, that you can give everybody the assignment, but how they do it is going to be different for every person. And is the goal to meet this thing and to get everybody here, or is the goal to meet them where they are? So with, with a show, it's sort of both because we do need to get to that stage. We do need to create that thing that we've all agreed upon that we rehearsed, but everybody's method is different. Everybody's just in terms of like learning like, oh, Nate is never gonna read his email. Okay, I need to make sure that I get in touch with Nate in a very different way than I get in touch with anybody else. You know, just you, you find that stuff. I know mm -hmm. you guys have examples in your own teams of, of just how mm -hmm. you have to meet people where they are in order to, with your eyes on the big picture, so that they don't necessarily have to have their eyes on that big picture, but they can contribute to it in the way that only they can, you know, and letting them have that part of the, that ownership of the contribution without driving yourself crazy, or should I say myself crazy, as a micromanager, trying to be better about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's stuff too, bro. It's like with choreography, I think especially it's like, it's a literal, like it's such a good explanation of how you need to communicate differently to people because some people need the counts some people need the words and then even sometimes it'll be like um you know like left hand and people are like but that's your right and it's like okay you know and it's like, i'm your mirror yeah <laughs> yeah so if you do have like 17 people and it's just like it's on the one it's when she says this it's the, the left foot forward it's right you know and it's like you, you have to get good at like even with the baloney guys with that group of people being like I have to say this 17 different ways, but like fast, you know, like kind of thing and just how to like get that language across. So in that way, yeah. And then Michael with the prompt yeah. stuff backstage, all the questions we get where it's like, yes, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like what Phoenix last night we were saying when we were reviewing with Global Tribe, uh, Moneyball, the movie, adapt or die is basically it, adapt or die. Right. So we are Last. running out of time. See, wow. this had to be two hours. I haven't even touched on the rest. We can do part two. But anyway, I, <laughs> you can do part two. I want to open it up to everyone who has a comment, a question, a mute, and just speak to Rory and Michael. Come on, don't be shy. Hi, Roy and Michael. I'm doing a I sort of drive-in movie theater in Oakland. I would love to partner with you guys anytime you do that. I started for my friends, and then it was just like my company was like trying to do events. So I mean, this is not for free. I'm just saying for you know paid money too. Fabulous. But I'm just saying. So it's in Oakland. And I bought a 20 foot by 20 foot projector screen, an FM radio. I mean, I literally built. I got permission from the city of Oakland, and oh. I've been running a drive-in movie theater. So I was just like, and it has a stage. And in my head, I've been thinking, you know, it'd be really great to have a live performance before the show. 
yeah. or something of that sort. And then it just when yeah, I've seen you guys at uh, Oasis. Oh, times. that's so great. Is Maybe that... I've seen you there too. <laughs> I <know. laughs> I'm always <laughs> front row. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. That's so creative, Prince. And that's something that Rory was really interested in, you know, like drive-ins. This could be the beginning of the, of like the resurgence of the drive-in. And we started doing car washes was, mm -hmm. is the new version of our show that we've been doing since we can't do anything during COVID. We started this sexy boy car wash out in front of Oasis, mm -hmm. which is just a drive-in experience you just kind of drive through and boys wash your car and people are so hungry to participate they're so hungry to get out to, to experience community and um, a friend of ours just had at the frameline film festival their movie premiered at the drive-in i think that was the most fun that i've had this entire pandemic was going to the drive-in and seeing these cars of people that you knew and just walking around in your mask on and it was the closest thing to community that we've had so you're just building that already like you that's amazing there's so much potential there and we'd love to help yes prince yes 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 more 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 phoenix <laughs> and i want in yeah i'm down you know that <laughs> yeah we know tons of drag queens too and performers yeah, of all different stripes that can use yeah. that stage for you and we could do you could do show specific movie specific performances yeah there's it, there's great potential mm -hmm. let's talk I gotta ask, what what movie is coming up? Can you just name like one movie you're gonna do that you're showing? Uh, the, the Wiz. Oh, yes. oh. <laughs> Rory's like he's on down, he's on down. I mean the dates, oh. honey, because you know, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> and you should do the car yeah. washes too. You should put it all together. Right, exactly. I mean, like, yeah, that parking lot entertainment. I mean, that is what that's the new thing. I mean, they're RuPaul's Drag Race. They're they're doing their tour is all drag. Yeah. Driving. It, it's huge. I'm in Southern California. It is huge down here. Humongous. Yeah. So well done. Good awesome. Anyone else? Anyone want to ask about a fourth uh, future show? I just want to show. I just want to join and in on, on the drive-in production. I'm in Toronto though, so I don't know how that's going to work next time. But <laughs> I, do, I do feel this is like a, a resurgence of that. So, yeah. you know, when you talked about the starting of this year and where we were all at, and we all kind of made that pirouette along with everyone else in the world, which is so unique yeah. when you think about it. So it is a time of reflection and I loved just hearing, I just wanna give a clap and fan shout for sharing your stories because they were, you know, they really tied in with our theme of mastering your mind. Um, and also, you know, as an executive assistant and I do a lot of events, I work at Mozilla with Ro and part of my role is putting on events. So right now, Zoom is it, but thinking beyond that, right? Like if, if we had California weather, maybe we could still be outside, right? Spreading out, doing classes that way. So I love hearing examples of how you're being creative and continuing to create and build on your events. Thank you. Yeah, please drop your links also for, uh, or hopefully you're gonna provide that because I thought it was so funny. I literally have virtual events tabs open and I'm like, and all the Airbnb experiences, for some reason I'm getting a lot in Portugal. There was a drag queens, there's some drag queens that were doing an event in Portugal. Yeah. I'm like, there gotta be something more close. To the, the, <laughs> why are they sending me to Portugal? <laughs> I put English. I literally checked the language. I'm, I'm like, like <laughs> I'm sure I'm imposing my will since I'm gonna be immigrating. Yeah, I was gonna there. say exactly. It's That's Phoenix's. It is. It's Phoenix's vibe. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. I, I'm. Yeah, I'll I'll book it. That's great. Oh, yeah, awesome. I'll well, send you the, the link for the class and and uh, Mozilla too, bro. I need I need to do a party for Mozilla online too because I have people. I do these games and stuff and people people act like they're nine years old. It's wild. I, I get it out of people. I did a I did a I, party for a family recently and these girls were like trampling each other to bring a toothbrush back to the camera first. <laughs> well, I promise you it's not from lack of plugging you every single time. <laughs> no but yeah. Phoenix, you have some parting words? I do. You know, I first of all I'm incredibly inspired by you guys. I mean a lot of people I most people who know me know my, my history. I used to be a, a singer for, wow, 18 years for a young lady named Lettucey. 
um, I love her. We, oh, oh my God. Background singer. <laughs> love her. <laughs> so love I've, I've performed everywhere in San Francisco, every single club. And, and to be honest with you, watching it year after year, like we went through these waves once before, like uh, dot com 1.0, you know, obviously yes. height and then bust mm -hmm. and watching clubs sort of die and reinvent, die and reinvent, um, especially in San Francisco. I lived there for, I think, 17 years off and on. Um, you know, the one thing that really pisses me off, I'll just say it, is the fact that the artistic community is always the first community to suffer. So seeing you guys really just not throw your hands up and run in the other direction and continue to push, continue to innovate, continue to figure it out, essentially, you call it FITFO, I won't give you the exact um, <laughs> translation. I think I you're going to got it. <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and even with Prince, you know, sort of, again, picking up the stick that was left by a lot of artists who've had to just cut and run and try to figure it out. You know, you guys being that sort of shining beacon of hope that we, you know, hear about, you know, in sort of folklore, and, and being an example for other artists within the community. Prince, you stepping forward and offering opportunities for artists in the community. This is really what it's about to me. And this is the reason why artists always survive. Art will never die because of people like you. So maybe, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't want that to be all Pollyanna on that ass, you know, <laughs> but I'm really, really, really proud as a, like a, a fellow artist and maybe an ex-artist and singer and all that. Um, who did cut and run, I won't lie. So I, I'm always inspired by people who, you know, where their art and, and that, that thing, you know what I'm talking about, is so deeply ingrained in who they are that giving up on that would literally be giving up on yourself. So, you know, highest fives to you both for continuing to tell your story, to continuing to give people joy in a really crappy time, let's be honest. And, and do it in such a way that is authentic, first of all, but like just so inspiring, so inspiring. And, you know, and obviously having advocates like Prince and me, I'm always trying to come up with ideas to help my friends who are musicians, for instance, who will have no, no income and are living check to check on government funds, essentially, and me trying to figure out ways to, you know, make them money, find them gigs, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, thank you. I, from the bottom of my heart as an artist and also as a businessman, for continuing to, to again, be a, an amazing example of just stick with it, you know? It's too important to give up, so stick with it. Thank you yeah. so much. Once an artist, always an artist. Always, that's true. So I'll okay. never give that up, you know? I'm always just waiting for, I don't know about the go-go gigs necessarily, but <laughs> there could be some more singing in my future. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get you a baloney. <laughs> yes, oh my God. Yes. Yes, yes. I, I told it. you, Phoenix. <laughs> you love it, you. Phoenix. It's on, Eddie, it's on. <laughs> Michael, you, you did say recently, like Michael was like, you know, whoever, and this is the truth before with the dot com boom, I'm sure too, but it is whoever, whoever just hangs in there and stays are going to be like the people that call the shots, at least in the art scene. Like, they're, what was it like Michael, you said, like the arbiters of the scene, the right? Arbiters mm -hmm. of culture. I mean, there, there's going to be a culture no matter what. So, what do you want it to look like? Do you want it to look like this or do you want it to look like that? You know, if you stick around, you, you have to be there in order to shape it. So, we're not going anywhere. We want to, we want to be part of the new culture, whatever it is um and to just say yes to it just as we sort of always have and find our place among it fantastic that's yeah. a great ending <laughs> right I get so everyone <laughs> yes whew, i have all their contact info uh my cut is about 30 no <laughs> kidding it's all theirs <laughs> mom <laughs> i know i i am their mom momager <laughs> <Mom -a> <laughs> <the> mom. <laughs> totally. mom mom so if you didn't catch any on the chat as far as for those who are listening to the recording just ping me and i am happy to share and spread all the info on roreography baloney mm -hmm. patty from hr yeah, buffy you. whatever else okay. Prince. <laughs> All right. Yes. Yes. And we'll be in okay, touch. Okay, everybody. Thank you. And thank you for spending yeah. time with us. Thanks, you guys. So, so great to meet you all. Bye-bye. Have a great bye -bye. day. Thank you. Prince. Bye.